Uh, just uh, first, I just wanted to say, uh, glad you could all join the CMOF Student Networking and Mentoring event today. Um, I would like to also thank all the presenters that uh, were able to come today. Um, I truly appreciate uh, volunteering your time. Uh, before we begin, I would like to mention though that uh, you feel free to pop your questions in the chat during the presentations. Uh, and at the end of each presentation, I'll read them out to the uh, presenters. We will try to keep it within the 20 minutes for each presentation, but any additional questions that anyone may have uh, can be taken at the end. We have about 20 minutes uh, toward the end of the presentation uh, for extra questions. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Jim Abraham, who is a retired Environment Canada meteorologist and our current vice president of CMOS. Uh, take it away, Jim. Thanks a lot, Christopher, and uh, certainly uh, nice to be here with you. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen. I'm sure I got the right presentation. I got all my weather and Twitter stuff on there. <laughs> Anyways, um, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Christopher said, I spent most of my career with Environment Canada or the Meteorological Service of Canada. And I, you know, you go back and look at what you did during your career and I wouldn't change anything. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, all aspects of my career. There's some pictures here. The top right is me uh, taking a water survey, uh, streamflow measurement in, in Nahani National Park in the Northwest Territories. This is a middle picture here is a visit of the uh, upper air station in Resolute Bay in Nunavut. And this bottom right picture is me crawling out of uh, Kermit, which is the uh, NOAA hurricane hunter after flying into uh, Hurricane Ophelia in 2005. And that's a story in itself since we ended up back in the US a little bit early because we lost two engines, but I lived to, uh, I survived to talk about it. <laughs> but I, I brought a reporter with me and, and after we lost two engines and the, uh, and, and the pilot said, we're heading back to, uh, to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the naval base there. And the reporter said, uh, Jim, I thought you said we could fly on one engine. And I said, yeah, but we don't wait for that to happen. Uh, anyways, um, a wonderful career and I'm really happy to uh, talk about it. Some themes um, and everybody has a different uh, passion. There's enough variety in the weather business to follow your passion. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and rather than trying to plan your career, because believe me, it's difficult to anticipate opportunities that come up, take a risk and try something that's an opportunity that comes up. So position yourself for opportunities as they arrive, which is really another way of saying, you know, be open to opportunities. And if you try something, you don't like it, do something else. Um, really just be open and adventurous and really you never know where you might end up. The wonderful aspect of our business, it's relatively small and you end up developing relationships and friendships right across the country, and not only across the country, in some cases around the world. The beauty of our business, weather and climate, it's a global business and we're affected by what's happening globally, certainly with climate change even more so. And so I encourage you to take advantage of the fact that Relationship building is really a, a nice opportunity in the meteorological business. We always worry about our weaknesses. Uh, my view is you have to understand your weaknesses. You're probably not gonna change yourself too much, but realize your strengths and build on those. And that's really been my mantra is, is I know I'm disorganized and I know that I am uh, uh, sometimes ramble on and on storytelling, um, but I use that to build on, on, on the strengths that I have rather than worry about my 
weaknesses. Now, the Meteorological Service of Canada is part of the government of Canada, which is most organizations you work for uh, have a certain bureaucracy. There's rules, there's policies and the like, but there's awesome benefits. And certainly working for the government of Canada and the Meteorological Service of Canada offers great benefits. And as I said earlier, with respect to positioning yourself, rather than, uh, especially when you're working for a bureaucracy, embrace the changes that come about. Uh, some of them are political in nature and uh, others are uh, associated with, uh, um, you know, changes in budgets and the like, but embrace them as opportunities. Have fun. There's lots of fun to be had in the business because really the job is making a difference for Canadians. And it's, so it's a wonderful uh, career. I started when I was in high school, of course, I was quite interested in the weather. In fact, I was interested in the weather from being a Boy Scout. I went to the weather office after having trouble finding it in Halifax and asked them what I should do to become a meteorologist. And they highlighted the coursework I would need, math and physics and, and the like uh, at university. But they also suggested that I apply for a summer job. And these summer jobs, I know all very many of my colleagues in the meteorological service that started out working as a student. I've got the link here. Um, uh, I won't go through it, of course. Uh, that's a picture of me. I'm the one with the little um, uh, football shirt on. I don't, um, it might be in the way of your of the screen. Um, but uh, I was doing a study on sea breezes. I worked three years as a, as a summer student. I got to do field work. I got to do research work. I actually got to do forecasting. We did the fire weather forecasts for Atlantic Canada back in, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, mid seventies. Uh, the meteorological service is celebrating 150 years this year. It's a core public service. It is offers services in both uh, official languages. I was working in Whitehorse and I got transferred to Montreal and I was the first uh, Anglophone to work in Montreal in, in 15 years and I had to learn French and it was a wonderful opportunity. Je peux toujours parler français. It was I, an immersion in the weather office and uh, and so uh, you do working for the government of Canada, I have an opportunity to learn both official languages. Um, the Meteorological Service is the key organization for uh, public safety, protection of property and the environment. And a number of the partners with the Meteorological Service are here with us today as well. And there, there's all kinds of different opportunities within the weather service, within the Meteorological Service. Certainly the forecasts that go to the public and the warnings are the core business. There's uh, an office in Edmonton and an office in Montreal that focuses on aviation forecasts. There's a naval office in uh, Victoria and in Halifax that focuses on uh, support to the Marine National Defense Program as well as one in Gagetown uh, that, that supports uh, aviation and, um, and uh, uh, the Army and uh, in, the, in the Armed Forces. Uh, there's a foundation for research and technology. If you like computers, there's all kinds of, of research done using uh, numerical models. And as I said, it's a global business. And so um, there's an opportunity to exercise global leadership and work with colleagues in the meteorological services of other countries. The last job I did when I left the Weather Service was looking after the observing program, which is a very important foundational program for the weather service. Now that I'm retired, I spend a lot of time on, on um, providing advice on climate change and, and uh, disaster and uh, resilience for communities. And there is an opportunity to be a manager if you indeed would like that role. There, there's a lot of Environment Canada offices around the country, but the ones in STARS are where the weather centers are. Uh, so some of the major capital cities have uh, weather centers and the Canadian Meteorological Center where a lot of the research is done on numerical weather prediction on the computer models 
is in Montreal at, in Dorval. And a lot of the other uh, research, uh, radar kind of research and uh, 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 research on uh, atmospheric chemistry uh, and, and severe weather is done in Toronto. And there's research done as well on climate and climate change in Victoria. Uh, Environment Canada itself, I've worked in other aspects of Environment Canada. I've done bird banding, I've flown helicopters over um, uh, tailing ponds, um, and the Weather Service provides a foundation for the rest of the department. Uh, certainly, the water cycle is driven by weather and climate, and so the Government of Canada is, is starting a water agency, and the water agency will fundamentally rely on the work of the, um, of the Meteorological Service of Canada. Um, uh, migratory birds or uh, birds that are endangered, like the piping plover. Some of the biggest threats, certainly here in Nova Scotia, is actually storm surge to some of the uh, breeding grounds of these migratory birds. Um, and when it comes to uh, uh, um, accidental spills, whether it be an oil spill, a nuclear uh, release, um, the Weather Service and the Meteorological Service provides models of where these oil spills and, uh, in, and uh, atmospheric releases actually may go so that evacuation and mitigation uh, can take place. I talked about relationships. Uh, I was trained as a meteorologist in Toronto in 1977 and 78. It was course 34. 40 years later, we had a reunion in Winnipeg and we were gathered in the same seating order that we were in Toronto to basically celebrate 40 years in the weather business. And I was the first Canadian trained in Miami to be a hurricane forecaster. And I certainly I made friends with a lot of the colleagues in the USA, the Caribbean and other parts of the world. And a couple of years back, 30 year anniversary of meeting some of those folks Three of us, a uh, senior forecaster from uh, National Hurricane Center in Miami, myself, and the head of the uh, hurricane program and the weather service in Cuba met in Havana for supper to celebrate 30 years of friendship. The Meteorological Service of Canada puts out some pamphlets. I won't take time to read this, but certainly uh, um, I hope if you would like you can have a copy of this presentation. There's lots of valuable information uh, and advice on career planning with the meteorological service, the sciences, the science program, as well as hydrology. And in the middle here, there's a list of some of the universities, uh, Dalhousie, UQAM, McGill, York University, Manitoba, UBC and British Columbia that offer pure meteorological programs. But many universities offer meteorological courses um, and the requirements are fairly stringent for the Meteorological Service of Canada. And I advise you to really understand the requirements to become an operational meteorologist um, as early as you can. There's a lot of math and physics, 30 credits required. There's a number of meteorolo meteorology courses that are required. So uh, it's usually uh, very, very, uh, tight the requirements. Uh, there's a, as I said, it's a bureaucracy. So the, the uh, screening is done uh, by a, a board of public service uh, um, kind of employment folks. And it has to be really clear in your application that you've met those essential um, uh, qualifications. And in fact, there's a link there to well, there's some advice to, 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 to use a career counselor, but I think, you know, uh, the idea of having maybe a mentor in the meteorological service or some of the other organizations we're talking with today would be a, a useful piece of advice uh, in planning your career to ensure that you take the right courses in university uh, to meet the needs of the various uh, organizations. So just some final thoughts. Um, really, as I said, the passion is, 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 is probably the best thing. Throw yourself into the job, uh, not worrying about the, the, the rules and guidelines, but enjoy it and have fun. 
and, and do the best job that you can because your country and the people actually depend on the work that you do. It's you who are in charge of your career development, not your professor, uh, not your boss. While they all help you, it's, it, it's up to us to take, take charge of our career uh, development. As I said earlier, the federal government offers a stability and wonderful um, um, benefits in the federal government and wonderful opportunities. And as I said, take a risk and experiment in, 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 as you advance your career. And as I said earlier, figure out your passion and your strengths and pursue opportunities that foster growth in your strengths. And don't worry as much about your uh, uh, less strong points. Have fun, make friends, best of luck to you all. And when I started in 1977, training to be a meteorologist in Toronto, the first thing I did is join CMOS and join the American Meteorological Society. And I've been a member of these professional organizations ever since. It's a professional responsibility to join CMOS and the American Met Society as I did as well. Uh, get involved. Uh, again, it's part of the wonderful opportunity to, to develop relationships and make good friends. And I'll leave it at that. This is a, a, a hotel I was staying at in Resolute Bay in the north. Um, a few years ago, and uh, um, I'll be happy to check the chat box now. I'll just unshare the screen and see if there's any questions. So, okay, so Gordon has said that that brochure is available um, through CMOS as well. So maybe uh, we'll find the link and share it to the with the participants, uh, Gordon. Yeah, will do. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? Uh, if you don't want to do it in the chat, uh, there's not that many of you, if you'd just like to ask. Yeah, I had a quick question. Sure. Um, are there specific math and physics courses that you would recommend? Well, the, the, the applied ones are the ones I took. So certainly calculus, numerical, analysis, uh, thermodynamics. Um, I took the, uh, of course, classical physics is, is, is important. So the physics courses are important. I took uh, lab courses. Now things have changed a bit, but experimentation courses, but most of the universities offer kind of a core uh, uh, suite of BSc, uh, you know, kind of honors courses, in fact, is what I took in math and physics and then the suite of meteorology. But the, the, to understand the science of the atmosphere, of course, you have, there's quite a bit of numerical methods, numerical analysis, differential equations. And so some of the math is, is somewhat challenging, but it's worth having that foundation, certainly. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I break in here, Alana, and, and add, some, add a bit to what Jim has said? Of having course. Having spent uh, 35 years teaching in atmospheric science programs, um, the first thing I want to say is that you can never know enough statistical techniques. Please take courses in statistics. The, the subject of weather is deeply embedded in the subject of climate, and climate is, after all, a solely statistical question. And then the next bit of advice that I have found tremendously useful was rather than taking a course in simple thermodynamics, try if you're able to take a course in statistical physics. Many universities offer that as, a, as an extension of, of classical thermodynamics and the habit of statistical thinking in terms of understanding the behavior of ensembles and, and a range of, of uh, sort of linked intellectual approaches is extraordinarily helpful in studying the atmosphere. So that's all I wanted to add to what Jim said. Great okay, advice, Joe. Thank you so much. I have a question. Um, I'm a BSc student in geography and environmental studies doing a uh, co-op at the Canadian Center for Climate Services right now. Um, I noticed there's still this, this siloing 
of different topics, but because we're doing some user needs research right now, um, it seems like the general public wants uh, access to weather and climate data in the same place. They don't necessarily make the distinction that a professional would. So I'm just wondering, like, I know there would be a whole lot of logistics behind it, but is there any plans to create more overlap, uh, more, more integration between the two fields of the meteorology and the, and the climate? Well, I'll, I'll just start uh, because it's a really good question, Amanda. The, the approach now, and although the bureaucracy hasn't caught up to it, is a seamless approach. The numerical models are basically being developed to be seamless from the small scales uh, and the small time frames out to the climate scale. And so this same seamless approach uh, to forecasting needs to be actually addressed on the service delivery as well. And, and so the questions I, I, I mentioned, although I'm a meteorologist and didn't spend much time on climate change as an employee, most of what I do now is on the climate side. And it's that mm. seamlessness, the seamlessness between the weather and climate business and the interconnectedness that really has to transform the service delivery and, and I will mention that there's uh, a, some special sessions at the CMOS Congress coming up in June and that's being uh, offered by the Victoria Center for CMOS. And it's it'll be available online. I uh, encourage you to register. And there's going to be a special symposium on 150 years of weather services. And some of this discussion on the seamlessness between weather and climate certainly should come up. Thank you. Um, I see a couple more questions. Um, if, if it's all right, we'll probably leave them till the end just to make sure uh, we can get in all the presentations. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll definitely try to come back to uh, some questions we still have for Jim. Um, so for our next presentation, I would like to welcome the Chief Meteorologist at the Weather Network, uh, Chris Scott. Uh, so Chris, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Christopher. I'm just going to search for my correct st uh, screen to share here, and we will get on with this. Okay, so picking up on what Jim said, Jim did a really fantastic job. So I think he made the uh, job for the rest of us much easier. Um, but the fact that you are all here today, I think shows your interest. And there's an expression saying, you need to be the CEO of your own career. Um, and so in what Jim said, in terms of getting involved, taking risks, you, you really have to think of yourself that way. You're the chief executive officer of your career. So, um, you know, there are great managers out there. Uh, I know Jim was one with an MSC. Um, Doug at the Weather Network is an exceptional manager. At the same time, all we can do as managers and mentors is give our advice and help you, but you actually have to take the step. So congratulations for taking the step to be here. Uh, you are way ahead of everyone else. Uh, right now, so keep that up. And one more thing that Jim said, which um, really struck me was about strengths and playing to your strengths. You can take that a step farther and say that your strengths are defined by not just what you're good at, but what you're passionate about as well. Your career will be long. Uh, I'm 20 plus years into my career now. Um, it seems to have gone by very quickly because I enjoy most days. Uh, if you can play to those things that you're good at and are passionate about, that's gonna fuel you for every day going forward. So don't let the fact that, uh, you know, if Doe just said, hey, you know, statistical physics is where it's at and you're going, oh my gosh, uh, that scares me. Uh, don't worry, you can get there. We've all gone through the hard times of, of a course or a certain part of our career. Um, just know that if we can do it, you can do it as well. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you about um, Palmerex and the Weather Network a little bit today. 
Uh, this is what you probably know of the Weather Network or Metamedia. Uh, we are a consumer weather company. Uh, we have a website, we've got a TV station, both in English and in French. We have apps, we try to be everywhere. We're um, the largest provider um, of weather information in Canada in terms of clicks and all that. Uh, but we also are very close partners with Environment and Climate Change Canada and are a member of CMOS and really operate within the weather enterprise in Canada, which I'll talk about uh, in just a few minutes. But here's maybe some of the things you don't know about what we do. So the company that owns the license for the Weather Network and Metamedia is Pelmerex. Uh, we are a family founded and run business. Uh, Pierre Morissette is the uh, majority shareholder and owner of the company, which uh, he founded back in 1989. And uh, we are also more than just Canadian. So we call ourselves a multi-platform information services and data management company. We specialize obviously in weather as well as technology. And we have offices in Oakville. That's our headquarters in Canada. That's where Doug and I work out of uh, in normal times. We also have a significant office in Montreal uh, down at the corner of uh, René Levesque and Papineau um, in the east side. And we have a Toronto office, which specializes more on some of our advertising data products. We, uh, about six years or seven years ago now, acquired the largest uh, consumer weather company in Spain called El Tiempo. I have not been to our Madrid office, but it's on my list. And uh, just over a year ago, we acquired uh, what we call a B2B or business to business uh, weather company in the States, in Salem, New Hampshire called WeatherSource. So as a weather company and a technology and data company, um, we're certainly embedded in meteorology. My role being on the senior management team is to speak to the meteorology, but we're also a business and every business has one thing that it needs to do. And that is to be a going concern. You have to make more than you spend. So just like how you have to manage your personal finances or your parents do um, as a business, you have to take in more money than you pay out. Uh, whether that's to uh, you know the cost for having computers or uh, doing processing of data or to pay your employees. So we always have to be thinking about what is that next step for us as a business to be profitable. Uh, a bit about meteorology at Palmerex. So we have 40 meteorologists in total. That represents uh, roughly 10% of our entire workforce. When I first came to the company, uh, it was actually way back, uh, 23 years ago, I worked part-time for a summer. I had a choice between working at uh, what was that time, the Atmospheric Environment Service, uh, the Meteorological Service of Canada now, uh, or the Weather Network. And I was torn because I, I could have had an internship doing severe weather, which was a huge passion of mine. But there was something about the, the bright lights, I guess, that drew me to the Weather Network. And uh, I went away and did a master's after that and, and decided to come back because at that time in my career, I really wanted to be a communicator. Um, I felt that I had a story to tell and I wanted to be able to tell that story about the atmosphere and the weather and how it affects people. So that's my journey. Um, but I could have equally um, had a great career within the Meteorological Service of Canada. Um, and, and I know a lot of people who have worked in both, both organizations and have loved uh, each experience. So as a, as a business, we obviously have a lot more than just weather. Uh, we have a huge technology area, just like MSC does. Uh, but we also have sales because that's what makes us the money at the end of the day is um, we produce content, but then we have to make money off of that content. So that's why, unfortunately, when you look at our app, sometimes you're going to see too many ads and you go, oh my gosh, I hate these ads. Well, we wouldn't have a business if it wasn't for those ads because people, um, the expectation is whether information is free um, so the way we make our money is by showing you an ad. Half of all of the meteorologists that we have are what we call operational. So if you're not sure what that means, uh, it means operational meteorology is essentially you're forecasting, you're looking at the weather as it is now and doing something with that, whether that's doing a presentation about it, um, whether that's uh, quality controlling some data, um, that's operational meteorology. And generally speaking, you're gonna be working shifts if you're an operational meteorologist. 
whether that's within the Met Service of Canada or the Weather Network or other private sector uh, companies. And that's a huge consideration. As you're choosing a career path, shifts are the reality. If you want to be a forecaster, you want to kind of do that day-to-day -day stuff, and not everyone's cut out for shifts, and that's okay. Uh, you can start off in that area, and you may find my body just can't hack it, and you can transition into something else. But uh, if you're going to do operational meteorology, you're going to have to be up at night, sleep during the day, and vice versa, and be able to throw your body around in all kinds of fascinating ways. Uh, so we're divided between the forecasting or the data quality control and the presentation. And that's something that Palmer X has that uh, not many other um, entities within the weather enterprise in Canada have. We've got a pretty big platform to use your voice and use your creativity to get a message out about the weather. Uh, and that's what I did in, in the first few years, um, actually the first probably five to 10 years of my career was more focused on the forecasting and then the presentation before I went into management. So the last bullet here is that we also have a lot of meteorologists doing other things outside of kind of the traditional, is it gonna to snow tomorrow? We have research and development, which is more the software engineering and programming, uh, product management. So, you know, how do those icons look? What text do we put with it? How is the, the English and the French gonna work? How long does that text have to be? And then the traditional management, the people leadership. Uh, Doug is one of our exceptional leaders that we have uh, here at Palmerex. What skill sets do you need? Well, uh, Jim touched on a lot of this kind of about looking at your career and uh, some advice. And when I think about what you need, not just at Palmerex, but anywhere, I think there's three main things um, that you as future meteorologists need. One is communication. And frankly, whatever you do, because not all of you will stay within meteorology. Some of you may fan out into other areas. Communication is absolutely key. And it's not necessarily being a slick and smooth presenter. It's the ability to clearly convey your ideas and results if you're doing research, but also to listen. Um, those two things are critical within communication. Communication is not a one-way street. You gotta be able to talk and explain you also have to listen to other people's perspectives and be able to, um, to unite those two things. And that ties into teamwork. Uh, so whatever you do, again, you're gonna be part of a team. Um, I would say only the most elite of elite minds out there can get away with not being the, the ultimate team player. And at Palmerex, I honestly haven't seen a case of someone who's not a team player work out. As brilliant as someone can be, um, if you're not able to accept that other people have valid ideas and to sometimes maybe take a back seat to someone, um, you're not gonna go very far. So uh, emphasize teamwork. And if you're interviewing with uh, the Met Service of Canada for a position, um, they'll look for the same thing. Emphasize your ability to work with others as part of a team and you'll go far. And the last one here, it might strike fear into some of you, um, I know I didn't love taking Fortran, which was frankly useless for my career. But when I'm talking to a lot of our meteorologists at uh, Palmerex, especially on Doug's team, uh, for their next career steps, I say coding, Python. Python is really the language of, of science. It's the, it's the computer language of science and meteorology. Um, even if you don't love it, push yourself to do some. Um, as Doe was saying about statistical physics, I mean, I like science, that scares me a little bit. Um, I want to push you to do some coding, take a Python course, start to understand how weather data is packaged. How do we get that data? And if you can start to play with that, we want you. You're going to put yourself at a higher level than someone who may be a great forecaster because the reality of where everything is going these days is that there is so much data around us. And weather forecasting is an area of huge amounts of, of data. And there will always be a role for um, the people that have a lot of abilities of forecaster. But if you can be someone who can for, not only forecast, but convert that into code, then we can scale. We can do a lot of things with your mind. Um, so I think that's the one takeaway here is that if you can code, uh, you're gonna go places. Uh, so I wanna take a little bit of a different tack now um, and show you where Palmerex fits with 
the overall weather weather ecosystem across the country or what we call the weather enterprise. And this, um, you know, don't worry if this is kind of like, what's he talking about here? Um, I think this is a really important concept that hopefully you'll hear more of um, as you go through your career. Um, I just think as a, as a young career professional, I didn't get it. I didn't kind of get where everything fit. But when you see the big picture, you start to be able to understand, okay, where does the Met Service of Canada fit? Where does Palmerex fit? Aren't they doing the same thing? What about this other company I want to work for? What about academia? We all have a role to play. And I think especially in the coming years, as budgets get more constricted, um, I know for us, as we you know, fight for dollars out there against some of the, the tech giants like Apple and Facebook and Google, um, all of this is going to become more important as Canadians to understand how we can be strong within Canada and export our strength internationally. So this is the concept of the weather enterprise. It's the global, not just national, but global collection of government, commercial, and academic activities um, that deliver and generate weather and climate information. And, and in business and, and, and in science too, there's something called a value chain. And um, you know, think about, uh, you know, there's lots of examples in life, but think about your own family. Like, like your own family often has a value chain if you think about making a meal. <laughs> Maybe someone is, is cooking the eggs, another one's an expert at uh, making the bacon, uh, someone pops the toast in, and between all of you, you do your individual roles uh, and you come out with the, the product, the meal at the end. So within the weather enterprise, we have to recognize, and this is something I always emphasize to, uh, to my leadership team uh, who aren't meteorologists, is that the vast amount of the investment is already done before a company that, like Palmerex gets to doing our thing. We have to have a lot of money in data collection, whether that's the Met Service of Canada uh, in installing and upgrading radars, and the software that goes on with processing that information, whether it's launching the weather balloons, Jim was showing a picture of, uh, of Resolute, uh, some of the remote outposts we have to, uh, to collect data. Um, how about satellites? The fact that we rely on other countries like the United States who's invested billions and billions of dollars in, in satellite technology to allow us to monitor what's going on in Canada. It really is uh, an enterprise, not just nationally, but globally. We rely on what happens in Russia, the observations taken there to figure out what's gonna happen in Canada five to 10 days down the road. Then after that, all that data has to be uh, computed. We have high performance computer modeling. And now more private sector companies are getting into this, but traditionally this has been governments. They've had the big budgets to do it. And we rely on the great work, uh, the world leading work of the Meteorological Service of Canada um, and Environment and Climate Change Canada, of the science and technology branch, of what they do with their models um, to do our work. But also we rely on the Europeans. We bring in the ECMWF, which is uh, considered the best model in the world uh, on average. And, and so you can see how it's really a global collection of, of how these things are done. And where we come in and where a lot of you will spend your careers is in the value added processing. So think of making a meal uh, you know, you can crack an egg, but it's what you do with that egg. It, it's how you scramble it. It's the salt you put in. Uh, it's the presentation that then provides extra value um, as you serve that. So that can be anything from, um, you know, doing some statistical modeling on data. It can be using your experience as a forecaster from Calgary going, I know when the wind is from the west, but the models aren't warm enough, so I'm going to up this temperature. Uh, those are ways you can add value to it. And then making a product. So at the end of the day, um, you have to have a, uh, someone consuming all of this stuff. We, do, we would love to do this for fun, but we have to do it as a business or as a service to Canadians or to meet some um, research need in a university setting. So we have to develop a product um, at the end of the day. And that product for us at the Weather Network is an app. It's a forecast on that. It's Doug's article about the pattern change that's coming. Um, it may be a notification that taps you on the shoulder saying it's gonna rain in 20 minutes. Uh, it could be at the Met Service of Canada, um, a warning, a tornado warning saying to take cover. Um, so I, I just wanted to present this to you because while it may seem a little bit foreign right now, if you have this concept of, okay, how does weather work? Well, you take data, you gotta do something with the data, 
you have to process it and you need supercomputers to do that or really advanced deep learning. Then you've got to do something with that to make it you know, a little bit different from everyone else to add some value. And then you've got to make a product out of it that people can consume. Um, if you can kind of get that um, overall idea in your head, then you're going to go uh, into interviews and be able to explain where you fit and maybe where the entity you're interviewing uh, fits. And, and they'll be impressed. I think if you can talk about the weather, uh, weather enterprise, they'll be very impressed. Um, and I want to leave off with this and, and talk about where Palmerex fits within this. I mentioned that we fit towards the end of the value chain, but this gives you an idea of all the different companies out there and entities that you may want to work for down the road. Now, I haven't put uh, academia on here, but if you think of where academia can come in, um, academia often comes into the first three areas in terms of better techniques. Um, so, you know, academia is an underpinning of everything that's done uh, where academia isn't worried about making money so much. It's about how can we do something better? And that's an engine which helps to fuel government weather services. It helps to fuel private sector. Um, so they're kind of a foundation to all of these activities. The government of Canada is, is involved in every part of that value chain. And different businesses take a look at this and say, where can we add something that's not being done right now? Where can we develop a market? Where can we uh, create a profit? And so what we do is we come in with the value-added processing. We have our own forecasters. We do our own um, machine learning on data. And then we make unique products uh, that people can uh, consume. And, and, and that's our business, essentially. And that's what I've uh, highlighted on this last slide. So it's a little bit of a different uh, tack on it uh, in terms of the ending. But I just do want to tie it back to what, uh, what Jim said. Follow your passion. Um, whatever you do in this, you're here because you love weather or you're curious about something. And even if your career takes you on a different path, uh, never settle for something that doesn't really fuel you because it is a long career, but if you do it right, it'll go by in the blink of an eye. Thank you so much, that was amazing, awesome. Uh, does anyone have any questions for, uh, for Scott? If so, you can uh, unmute your mic or you can leave it in the chat or. And also if anyone has any questions that they can think of, uh, we can also add them toward the end. So uh, we can, if anyone, uh, oh, I think I see one in the chat. Um, yeah, one from Kate. Uh, is it possible to take coding classes outside of university, like as upgrading? Yeah, absolutely. And um, maybe I don't have any of my fingertips. Not sure if you do, Doug. But there, there are some free ones out there. I think uh, was it MIT, Doug, that offers some some good Python courses. Yeah, a couple of our uh, meteorologists have taken courses from MIT and those courses uh, are done well and they have served um, those meteorologists very well in advancing their careers. Yeah, and if you, uh, so, so cater anyone, if, um, if you can't find any resources online, uh, just reach out to, to Doug or I or Christopher and he can get in uh, touch with us as well. Uh, that's the great thing about today is there's lots of resources out there that you can uh, get your hands on. So, uh, uh, and I think they're, they're, pretty, uh, they're pretty well laid out in terms of the, uh, the instructive nature. And Doug is a, Doug's an educator by a trade as well as a meteorologist. So it's a passion close to him. Uh, and I know he's helped a lot of our, our folks kind of guide them in that direction. I just wanna add, add to that, uh, absolutely take the MIT Python course. Mm -hmm. And yes, Python is the way to go. Um, but do something more than just take the course. Start the course with a problem of your own in mind, something you want to solve. And, and the course will have very stylized problems that have been carefully selected to instruct certain things. But what you want to do is start with a problem of your own, something you're interested in, something that's not going to be covered in the course, and something that will actually force you to use the coding that you've learned in a different context. It, it's a it's a good point. I think the challenge there we've found is that people they they don't know where to start. I think that's the thing. It's it's almost so if you're a forecaster, you're like, 
I don't even know what I'd use this for. And an example would be, well, if you're passionate about uh, hurricanes, let's say, well, think about how you might want to um, plot the last 20 years of hurricane tracks and, and go, that's what I want to do. And then how can I do that? Well, Python is a tool I can use and, and then go in with it to, to those point of like, that's the problem I want to solve. And you may take a couple different avenues through it. Um, but I think if you can get that in mind, so, something that's passionate uh, for you, uh, then you can apply it. And well, let me give you a personal example. Um, I started learning Fortran in 1968, would you believe it? Um, and eventually got rid of that thing and learned MATLAB and all my students said to me, wow, you write MATLAB code with this weird Fortran accent. And then when, when the pandemic hit, I said, you know, MATLAB is an ugly thing anyhow. Uh, I should learn Python. And so I set myself to solve a problem. It was obvious. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So I used Python and coded up the pandemic equations. Simple three component uh, pandemic equation. And that's how I learned Python. Awesome. Hopefully that uh, answers your question. Uh, I don't see any more, um, but again, if you have any, just uh, feel free to add to the chat. We'll try to get to, uh, to it at the end. Uh, for our next presentation, uh, it is uh, Dr. Doug Gillum, uh, which is a meteorologist at the Weather Network, as well as an educator, uh, for a former present, uh, professor at uh, Mississippi State University. Uh, so take it away, Doug. Thank you, Chris. It is a... Um... It is a privilege to be here, and it just says so much about all of you to, to take time to participate and, and listen and to learn from, um, from this session. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, what a great opportunity. Uh, the career advice that you've already received from Jim and, and Chris, um, great advice so far. And they have introduced you to two of the um, largest employers of meteorologists in Canada. Um, what I've been asked to talk about today is a little bit about the um, what it's like to be an operational forecaster and also to talk about just a little bit about my time in academia. We're gonna, you're going to get more about that uh, in, a, in a later session. Um, but uh, just sort of I, I, you know, I love what's been said about being the CEO of your own career, taking risk, following your passion, um, that's all the thing. Those are all things that I have done. And, um, you know, I took a bit of a circuitous um, journey in my in my career, um, some non traditional routes um, in that. Uh, and yet I look back and there is nothing that um, that I regret um, in in that. And, and it's just fun to look back and see how um, experiences and uh, you, you, you never knew how things would fit together and how you know down the road you realize that e everything um, did fit. You know, you look back and see how that prepared you for, for something else. And I am trying to see here. Sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen, but I can't find the right screen to share. As anyone who, yeah, I, I do um, I do briefings daily, and anyone who's seen my computer can tell you I um, I always have way too many. I, uh, my philosophy is you can never have too many tabs open on your uh, computer, but that is coming back to bite me right now. That, okay. It confused me too, Doug, because it's it's different because we use uh, a G Suite, so it's uh, Google Meet, and with Google Meet, when you go to share, it shows it shows each window and tab you have open, so it's easy. Whereas on this. It only shows the application, so it'll show Chrome. But I'm like, where's my presentation? What was my email that was up on Chrome? So I had to click on my email. So I, I think Doug, if you've got your, uh, if you can see your Chrome um, tab, it'll be the first tab in what your uh, Chrome browsers. I think that'll do it. Uh, all right, just a second here. That's not it. All 
right now. I'm having trouble getting back to Zoom. We can see it. So we're on your computer. You just have to, yeah, now you just have to get onto your uh, tab with the presentation. So you are seeing my computer? Yeah, yeah we got it. Yeah. You got it? Oh, awesome. So it's got your Sorry. Word. There's a Word document there. So you just have to get off of that and onto your. Uh, oh, so you're not seeing the presentation? No, no. We've got a Word document. Maybe it's, I don't know if you've got two monitors, maybe, or. Yeah. I'm just going to oh, I'm sorry about this. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's got it. All right, sorry about that. I did not get it into meteorology because technology was my strength. All right, so um, as you know, I work for the Weather Network and I am the manager of the Forecast Center. Um, I really, my career has uh, had two distinct um, different paths. Um, Currently, I am the manager of the Forecast Center and I oversee our seasonal and monthly forecast. Prior to that, um, I taught at Mississippi State University. Um, I was uh, an instructor. Um, I taught a wide variety of courses, um, many of them on campus, but also online. Many of you may be uh, more familiar with the distance learning program from Mississippi State University, which you know, to be honest, hasn't always had the, the best of reputation um, just because it, it um, is different from what is at many um, on-campus programs and also different from what is on campus at Mississippi State University. The distance learning programs were really developed to, to fill a need to provide meteorology training to those who are on air. Um, you know, historically, the people on air telling the weather story weren't necessarily meteorologists, especially we saw that in the United States. And so they provided meteorology training to on-air presenters, but it, the distance learning program didn't have all the calculus and physics um, that you, know, you take in a traditional on-campus meteorology program, um, which is taught at Mississippi State uh, as well. Uh, they also have a couple of graduate programs in applied meteorology. Um, they provide um, training to the U.S. military, so they provide all the operational meteorology courses that one would need to be a meteorologist in the, in the military. Of course, they would have to take their physics and calculus uh, elsewhere. Um, and we also had a GIS certificate program, and that's also another area of uh, growing need for meteorologists, another way to kind of set yourself apart from, from others. If maybe um, coding is not your thing uh, or statistics, uh, GIS is another skill that's also advantageous in the field um, for certain career tracks. Um, so I, yeah, I taught forecasting um, and I was the director of our distance learning programs there. And with the different roles that I had there, um, Part of the job that I enjoyed the most um, was being a mentor and advisor. I think that came from the fact that my dad was a high school guidance counselor for 40 years, and um, that was just sort of in the blood. Um, so first, to give a little bit of just about my background and journey, um, you know, many of you who are in meteorology have loved it from you know as long as you can remember. My first grade teacher told my dad that I would be a meteorologist. Um, you know, when it was snowing. Um, I was, oh, my eyes are always glued to the window and that hasn't changed. Um, when it is snowing, I'm always looking outside. Um, now, one of the things that it's been highlighted that I want to highlight is just the importance of taking advantage of every opportunity that you can get to gain an experience, to learn something new, to meet um, somebody, to develop a relationship. And while I think all of you are past these first couple of steps in my career journey, um, when I was in high school, I did an internship at the Niagara District Weather Office. That's back when Environment Canada had more offices than they do today. This is an office that has since been closed. But 
so thankful for those who invested in my life and in my career. Um, we had uh, two of the meteorologists at the Niagara District Weather Office just really took me under their wing. Uh, in high school, I remember coloring positive vorticity advection and warm air advection and cold air advection on their massive charts. And they taught me some of the fu fundamentals of meteorology and gave me some good advice. I also spent some time uh, volunteering with the National Weather Service in Buffalo. Um, I also was an observer for them. Uh, being in the, Growing up in the Niagara region, it was actually valuable to get reports from the Niagara region of severe weather and, you know, and visibility on snow squalls and such um, before weather reached um, uh, Western New York. Um, so I did, uh, um, did a lot of volunteer work with them sometime in the office and then just providing reports. Now, as growing up though, I mean, I was always conflicted. I mean, on the one hand, my first grade teacher predicted I'd be a meteorologist. On the other hand, family was so important to me. And I knew that shift work was a big part of being a meteorologist. I also knew, you know, if you worked you know, in operational meteorology, I'd be doing shift work. Strangely enough, that was a deterrent to me. And yet when I finally did work shift work, I absolutely loved it. But at the time I didn't think that was something that I wanted to do. I also thought about TV weather, uh, hard to believe. You know, I, I was told I had the face for radio rather than TV, but I actually had some interest in that. But again, the main shifts, uh, I have dual citizenship. So the North America was open to me. Um, as I looked at the TV stations, whether it's Canada or the United States, the different roles, if you're the chief meteorologist, you're working night, the evenings, you're never home with family, or you get up really early in the morning, you're working weekends. So I was always conflicted between that and what my dad did, and he was a teacher. Um, so I actually, when I went to my undergrad school, my plan was really to go just become a physics and French teacher. And I thought I was going to live in Sault Ste. Marie because I love lake effect snow. Um, well, I didn't end up being a physics and French teacher, but um, I did take a lot of physics and French classes and I spent uh, actually an, an opportunity came up very early to do radio, which worked well since I had the face for radio, I guess, rather than TV. Uh, I continued to do some volunteer work for the National Weather Service and I was a teaching assistant. All that was very valuable for developing relationships and gaining experience. Um, I then went on to Mississippi State University. Um, and earned my master's of science degree in meteorology. Um, and even at that point, I'm not 100% sure of where I wanted to go with my career. Um, for permanent certification in the state of New York, which is where I did my undergraduate degree, for to be a teacher, you had to have a master's degree within five years. So I pursued my master's degree, but I decided I wanted to do my master's not in education, but in what I loved, pursuing my passion, that was meteorology. And as um, I was a teaching assistant, of course, I got involved being in the States. I got involved in AMS and the American Meteorological Society and National Weather Association and attended conferences. Um, and just like you're uh, participating in CMOS and in their conferences. And then, you know, to be honest, when I went to Mississippi, I couldn't wait to leave. I'm Canadian. Mississippi did not get anywhere near enough snow for me. Um, but the opportunity came up to join the faculty as an instructor. They were developing a program for teachers in how to teach earth science, uh, all the earth sciences, including meteorology, and how to better prepare teachers to bring meteorology and climatology to the classroom. Seemed like a great opportunity um, to, uh, you know, to strengthen my resume someday, um, you know, for, for other opportunities. I ended up staying 15 years. And again, just want to highlight. Um, you know, opportunities come when you work your hardest, you know, you're never good enough is never good enough. You just, you take the approach that I'm going to do my best. I don't know who is watching, but in this case, you know, my work as a teaching assistant, even teaching courses outside of meteorology opened up a whole new career opportunity um, in working, um, in becoming the director of, of distance learning. I also taught the analysis and forecasting classes at Mississippi State. And that is one thing that um, they do that um, ironically is unique and that they have a heavy focus on um, forecasting in their uh, meteorology uh, program. Um, just one thing I'll throw out there, I mean, it seems rather trivial, but um, as a student and then faculty participated in the National Collegiate Weather Forecast Contest, and then that went away and it became the Weather Challenge ran by University of Oklahoma. Um, I used, I did participate in it as a student. I learned a lot about forecasting doing that. It's a game, but it causes you to 
follow the weather on a daily basis for a lot of different unique locations. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a it's a competition that all the you know, many of the meteorology programs across um, North America participate in. And I, as a teacher, I just use that as a tool to get my students following the weather on a daily basis. You know, um, forecasting is an art and a science, and I could teach them the science, but they have you have to do it to develop the art you just have to you learn in forecasting by forecasting and the contest um when you're competing for, competing for a score and a rank um it, it just motivates you to follow things more closely um develop the as a director of distance learning we developed an applied meteorology program um, a master's degree program i spent a lot of time recruiting mentoring advising and well, this academia was not my plan. Once I stayed at Mississippi State, it quickly became obvious that pursuing my PhD, um, which they paid for, which was great, um, was advantageous to me. So I completed my PhD while doing all those things. And also uh, two kids came along at the same time. So that's where I became, uh, that's where I learned not to sleep. And that served me well when I did some shift work, um, when you do all those things at the same time. Uh, I returned to Canada in 2013 to join the amazing meteorology team at the Weather Network. Uh, I worked at the briefing desk for a year. To um, be honest, when Chris told me that I, would, I was going to be at the briefing desk, uh, you know, my heart sank a little bit because I'm terrible, as I've already proven to you, I'm not great with technology. And, um, yeah, and yeah, well, I'm not an artist at all. And I thought, good grief, how am I going to be building graphics? But um, they trained me well. And uh, it was an amazing time. And that just opened up new opportunities. And I just love the communication side of weather. And, uh, but I then went on to become the manager of the Forecast Center. I've been doing that for seven years. I uh, have an amazing team that I get to work with and to be part of their career development and part of their developing the forecast that you see on our website and our app. Uh, I lead the team um, in doing our monthly and seasonal forecasts uh, as well. Now, I'm going to go over this really quickly because Chris has already touched on some of these things. But in terms of meteorology positions at the Weather Network, you know, I oversee the team in the Forecast Center that um, produces the forecast that you, uh, you see on our different platforms. We do have digital meteorologists that are more involved in the writing, the production of graphics, and the communication side. And I really I work as a link between the two teams. Uh, making sure that we're effectively communicating our forecasts, that we're aware of developing weather stories, we're aware of changes that are coming into the forecast even before they show up on the on the forecast or on the app or the website. Um, we also have a team of um, in research and development. And Chris, yeah, we didn't share our presentations with each other. I was just going to highlight the need for meteorologists who can write code. Chris has already talked about that, so I won't go into that any further. Um, so my team. And the uh, digital meteorologists were responsible for the preparation and communication of weather forecasts and products that you see on our different platforms. Now, my team, we monitor current weather conditions. We perform regular quality control checks on the forecast grids. Uh, we when there's you know, when we see departures between what the, our forecast is and what is happening re in reality, or departures between what the models are forecasting versus reality. Um, you know, we make modifications to the forecast. But we do two primary updates. Again, our hands are on the forecast. Our forecasts are not automated. Um, the forecast that you see uh, across Canada, uh, we bring in the model data and we can go with a particular model, a blend of models, or if we think all the models are incorrect, we can draw in the precipitation. We can increase the sunshine or increase the cloud cover or the precipitation amount. Um, and uh, here's just an example of the, the, the for graphical forecast uh, system that we use to um, to produce the forecast. I'm not gonna walk you through all the different products. It's just a, an example of what one of the screens would look like in the, the forecast center. Um, so our East Desk meteorologists, um, you see on the left, the different, um, uh, different elements of the forecast that we could edit sky, probability, precipitation, QPF, pop, weather type, et cetera. Uh, and this is just an example of a screen that is showing the um, sky cover. And again, this could be based on a model, a blend of models. And then we can also go in and pencil up or down the amount of cloud cover 
um, that you would see based on as we compare how the models are performing versus um, what's actually happening or a bias in the models. For example, if you know, we know on, a, on the weekend, we're gonna be in the dry slot of a storm and the models often overdo the cloud cover, we could go in and, and reduce the cloud cover. Um, and we can, you know, again, our hands are on all element parts of the forecast, you know, whether it's probability precipitation, gonna make adjustments up or down, uh, precipitation type, weather type, we're talking a, uh, we got fog, is it snow, ice pellets, freezing rain, rain, um, so we can go in and make adjustments to weather type. And um, again, this comes out while you look at your app or the website and see uh, five to 10 centimeters of snow for Toronto. No, this is not a current forecast. Um, five to 10 centimeters of snow for Toronto. Well, what's that mean? In the system, there is an actual amount for a specific period of time. And again, we can make adjustments to that by adjusting snow ratios or QPF. And so that's that's what an operational meteorologist does on my team in the forecast center. We work, um, you know, we've got two shifts. We've got the day shift and the night shift. And we work on a rotation where you work two days uh, and then you flip over to two nights and then you get your four days off in between. Um, and uh, so it is shift work. Um, and again, that's not for everyone, but many have found that getting the chunks of time off in between your rotations um, is a, a big um, positive. So again, here are the you know, examples of our forecasts and we can go in and, uh, you know, a lot of times people will ask me, can't you change the forecast? Well, technically I can change the forecast or my team can change the forecast, um, but obviously we can't change the weather, which is really what people are wishing that we could do. Um, so just quickly, some advice and recommendations. Uh, again, you've been given some amazing advice. I can't really compete with some of those great points, but just want to highlight from the perspective of an operational forecaster. Again, that's not that's not all of you, um, but if you just love to forecast, I believe, and you may disagree with me, and that's okay. But I believe to be a highly successful forecaster, you have to love the weather. Doesn't mean to be a highly successful atmospheric scientists, you have to love the weather, but to get to become an excellent forecaster, you have to love the weather, you have to be committed to learning something from every busted forecast, and there's going to be many of those. The best forecasters have busted countless forecasts, but they've been committed to learning something from that. Every mistake is an opportunity to learn something, but it's important to recognize that you will never arrive in the field of forecasting. You'll never get to the point where you'll, if you think that you have learned all that there is, well, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure because one, the field is changing so quickly, the products available to us, the tools, um, but the, the weather's constantly changing. We've got the climate that's changing. Um, you'll never arrive. There'll always be more to learn. And as long as you have that approach, um, you will um, continue to learn and you can set yourself apart from, from those who aren't. Um, but it's important to, you know, when you issue a forecast, don't be just somebody who walks away from that and go, well, I really don't care if it snows in Calgary tomorrow. I said it would, but oh well. You know, find out if it snowed in Calgary and if it didn't, figure out why, and that will make you better. So you must continue to learn throughout your career, and most likely you will learn, continue to learn after your career if you really love the weather. A couple other quick things. Be aware of your social media presence. Uh, it can make you or it can break you. Uh, it's something that uh, was never told to me because we didn't have social media when I was in school. Um, but that it, you know, two of our meteorologists, um, their social media presence was critical to our decision to hire them. They really proved and set themselves apart. Uh, and you could really see what they knew and their passion for weather um, through that. On the flip side, you know, you can burn some bridges that way too. Um, it's a small and close community. Be sure to network, but keep in mind, you never know and you might need a reference. Don't burn any bridges um, and just work with, you know, be passionate and work hard in everything that you do, even if it might appear to be something that's not directly related to your cur current goal or pathway. Um, just quickly a word about my, um, my philosophy, Chris's philosophy. Chris actually is the one who's, you know, really taught this to me. Um, hiring the right person is 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 the priority of course you want you've got to find somebody who's qualified but when you've got two candidates who on paper appear to be have equal qualifications 
you know, you want the right person who's going to fit into your company. And that's where character is so important. Who are you when nobody's watching? Um, and again, social media can give a lot of that away too. So um, we, we work hard to find the right person. Um, we've not hired some brilliant people because they weren't team players. They weren't going to fit in and they wouldn't have lasted well, long and they wouldn't have contributed to the growth, um, to, to, to our mutual growth moving forward. A couple other quick thoughts. Subseasonal um, long range forecasting may well be one of the better opportunities for adding value to computer guidance in the future. The computers are getting better and better at forecasting. And you know, our, our hope is that as meteorologists, we won't be completely replaced. And I don't believe we will be completely replaced, but uh, it becomes harder and harder to beat the models and you know, especially in routine short range forecasts. Um, the further out you go in the long range, the better the pattern recognition can serve you. Um, but I, when you talk about uh, maybe great opportunities over the next decade or so, um, subseasonal forecasts, talking about the next big pattern change, recognizing when the upcoming month is actually going to be exceptionally warm or cold or wet, dry, stormy, whatever. You know, looking at the, the global patterns, the Madden Julian oscillation, uh, being able to identify when sudden stratospheric warming events are going to occur before they occur. Um, those are great opportunities for research, whether you're planning it to go into academia or do a graduate degree or get into operational forecasting. I think there's some great opportunities there. And I, I just, I think I'm, you know, me and many other meteorologists, we're the luckiest people out there. So many people talk about dreading Monday because you have to go back to work. I have never dreaded Monday or the first day of a rotation because if you love weather and if that's why you're in the business, then, you know, you, you, you have the opportunity to make your hobby your career. Now, that the challenge there is to find work-life balance. Um, if you have a family, it's easy for your work, which is also your hobby, to take over your life. And it's important to make sure you do find that balance. But again, if you love weather, uh, I hope you can find a way to make it your career. You'll never dread a Monday. Um, it's, uh, you know... I, I know so many people counting down the days to retirement. I'm absolutely not. Uh, I'll stay as long as Chris will have me at the Weather Network. I love weather. And um, I just want to encourage you as you pursue your passion, uh, reach out if you have any questions. I hope um, something that I've said is helpful to you and uh, certainly happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh, and I can speak to the weather challenge. I had. I did do it uh, last year. It was awesome. Uh, it was a great experience to kind of uh, get more forecasting experience in and kind of, uh, like you said, uh, you know, learn the weather for certain locations each day. So it was, it was a great experience. Um, yeah. And if anyone has any questions, please, uh, please pop them in the chat. Um, and if not, uh, by all means, you can pop them in the chat uh, towards the end of the presentation and we'll try to get to them. Um, but yeah, and you can also unmute your mic if you have any as well. I was have to put in a plug for Mississippi State. We finished first or second ten consecutive years in the in the weather challenge. So, it, but again, I just saw so you know we, some of the people who work for us have uh, participated in that. Um, it's it's just a great opportunity to uh, an experience in a, in a in a fun way. Yeah, no, definitely. And I really like how all the locations are kind of like uh, in different, like you get a bit of mountains and uh, there are one of the locations in like Florida. So you can kind of get to uh, forecast for tropical cyclones and the hurricanes and uh, snowstorms in Boston. And so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, if no one has any questions, again, you can just uh, pop them in the chat. We'll get to them hopefully after. Um, if not, uh, the next presentation uh, would be uh, meteorologist and storm hunter for the Weather Network, Mark Robinson. Uh, take it away, Mark. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, it's, it's a little intimidating to be, uh, to be presenting after all these absolutely brilliant people. Um, so to, to take myself down a few pegs, and, and maybe Chris Scott a little bit. Chris is, I can tell with a grin on Chris's face that he knows exactly what I'm going to show. So I'm, I'm hoping that this will work um, because inevitably uh, there's, always, there's always issues. Um, but here we go. 
just to give you an idea of what it is uh, I do. That, that, that sound in your ear, that's really annoying. That you get Can everyone see that? Roof down or a window down, going down the it's, highway it's, at a buck 20. That's the winds, they're coming in that fast. Yeah, I mean, what's striking me right now is the snow in the, that's in the wind. This definitely feels like where we, uh, in a hurricane, if you get down on the beaches and you get the sand kicked up, this feels exactly the same as that. So this is, for me, a full-on snow cane. The other thing that's new for me, too, is the sound of the wind. It's called the roar. It's a roar and it's a scream, and it's something you've just never heard if you haven't heard winds over 140 kilometers per hour. Yeah, this is definitely what we call the, the hurricane roar, and that's what I'm always looking for. And it's almost a subsonic. Have you ever been to a concert? Those were the days. Good, good <laughs> times. <laughs> I went about 30 feet away. Okay. Took me a while to stop. I think we're okay. But we've lost our mic shield. Okay. You okay? We've lost our mic shield, though. So we're going to have to jump. Okay, so yeah, I, I'm the uh, I'm the idiot that uh, Doug and Chris uh, sends out into the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the and the winter storms. So I want to give you an idea, um, a little bit of of where your career can go uh, when you talk about something like the Weather Network. Uh, you know, Doug and Chris uh, were definitely showing you a lot of the the sort of behind the scenes how it gets done. Um, but you have to keep in mind that the weather network is a product. We're trying to show the weather. We're trying to get an idea, you know, show people what's going on. And in some ways, um, quite often, we're trying to show and, and get people ready for a severe weather event that's headed for them or is going to happen in, uh, in a few minutes or uh, in a short period of time. So that's where I come in. Um, I actually began my career at the Weather Network quite a while ago doing all kinds of different things. I sort of blazed my own trail at the Weather Network. Um, I've done a lot of different things at TWN. I've worked as um, a meteorologist. I've worked as a writer. Um, I've done uh, on air, uh, lots of on air uh, stuff. Um, and uh, of course, I host a show called Storm Hunters. It was sort of our first good long format programming. I'm going to show you that in, in a few minutes. Um, but I just want to give you an idea that you don't necessarily have to slot yourself into one career path and stay on that path. You know, this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. Um, because I got in and uh, sort of was all over the place. Uh, and poor Chris had to, uh, to manage me. I'm sure he enjoyed that quite a bit um, as I was trying all sorts of different things. And so what ended up happening was um, I started, as I said, I started off as a writer, came back, I went back, I literally went back to school for meteorology at uh, York University. So I do have uh, my meteorology certificate. Um, so that was that was four years of school after I'd done four years of uh, an undergrad uh, science degree at uh, the University of Guelph. So I've had way too much schooling. Um, and now I'm the, uh, the idiot that they, uh, they send out into the, into the storms. Um, the reason I chose to do this, and, and this is a, a big part of, um, of what I wanted to sort of get at, um, was that I have a real passion for the weather. I have a passion for the natural world. Um, I love science. It's sort of the, the, one of the most critical things to me. And a place like the Weather Network allows you to not only really get involved with the science, with the, um, with like the day-to-day -day operations uh, of just, of trying to forecast, trying to figure stuff out. It also gives you a chance to, or like for me specifically, it gives you a chance to sort of be on camera and, uh, and do some silly, silly things. Um, I've been through 23 hurricanes. Uh, the first one that I did was actually uh, like the first one uh, that I was on air was Katrina. Um, the Weather Network had never had anybody on air. And I remember actually being on air with Chris um, a couple of times during that. Now we had no way of giving video. So it was all on the phone. So I was literally on the cell phone screaming into this phone um, to Chris while he was on air. So he was actually on air at the time. Um, and it was, it was just absolutely uh, wild because it was, um, not only was it something that um, was this a massive meteorological event, it was also a huge news event and it affected so many people's lives. There was um, an aspect of understanding what it was like to be uh, in this hurricane at the same time, uh, understanding or like being able to 
deliver information out there to people that didn't necessarily have it. And this was sort of the first time we'd ever had, you know, up to the minute uh, information being delivered to Canada. So that was something for me was, was really, and I realized how much uh, I was like really going to, uh, uh, to, to be a part, like how much the weather network is now going to be a part of my own life uh, and how much I quite enjoyed being on air uh, because I just started my meteorology degree at that point and I did want to do but on the desk and sort of understand that but I never thought I'd get the chance to do on air stuff and of course that changed so the other thing that uh, when, once, once I was working at the weather network I was on the the briefing desk as a, like a part-time and I actually got a chance to um, get uh, involved with a, a show that I, I host called Storm Hunters. And uh, I'm gonna show this one to you and hopefully this will work. I'm just gonna pull this open. So I like, you have to, you have to excuse me because everybody else has like got these beautifully, uh, beautiful presentations. I've got a bunch of video to show you because that's a lot of what I do. I do a lot of improv. I just stand out in the weather and go, this is what's happening and this is how it's going to impact you. Um, and so this is sort of how I do everything. Um, there we go. And just make sure. Where is it? Uh, oh, I know why I didn't do it. Okay, give me a second. Okay, I'm just going to pull it back to there. And then hopefully this will work. I got you gotta love technology. And it's not showing me. Ah, there it is. Our big question is, uh, is the flight going to be canceled? 6 a.m. this morning, they shut down the roads. There was many records that were shattered by this storm. I'm completely overwhelmed by the amount of... Okay, so yeah, that's the, the TV show I've, I, I started to do. And I've gotten a chance, like I've been through, um, as I said, 23 different hurricanes, 50 or 60 tornadoes. I was chased down the road by the world's largest tornado in El Reno, Oklahoma. Um, I've been through the north, almost the entire Northwest Passage. Uh, I've been to Antarctica, Mount Everest. Um, I've jumped into four volcanoes, um, including one in a, two in a war zone. Um, that was fun because we had the UN giving us security. So I got to fly in a helicopter gunship. Um, so it may seem that a lot of the weather network jobs, you know, do just, you know, uh, are at the office and, and doing a lot of forecasting, but there is this huge opportunity to do a lot more than that. And it doesn't necessarily mean uh, even at the weather network, there's lots of other different places. Uh, but as I said, you know, one of the big things for me was I, I sort of blazed my own trail and sort of made this uh, become to sort of be my own. And to the Weather Network's great, uh, <laughs> I just have to say thank you so much to them because they, they really decided to uh, support me and, and do that. So for instance, right now, um, I'm actually working on a series called Science Behind the Weather. And uh, it's basically looking at uh, all the science and uh, trying to translate all the extraordinarily complex uh, pieces and, uh, and uh, different aspects of weather into something that you know, can take five minutes, which is not easy. So for me to have a, a full meteorology degree is absolutely critical to, uh, to doing the job that I have now, even though I'm not doing a lot of forecasting and, and I'm going to admit this in front of Chris and Doug right now, is that my forecasting has got kind of rusty in the last little while. So they can't put me on the briefing desk anytime soon. It would take a little bit of training. Um, but that's, I mean, I, I, I joke a little bit, um, but there is a lot, of, uh, a lot of work that I do do in forecasting. So there's all those aspects, but the, for me, the one amazing thing for myself is that I get to go out and experience the weather. 
Um, I've drive, you know, Chris has come out with me. Um, I, Doug has not come out with me yet, um, but I'm trying, I'm just going to try and drag him out at some point this summer um, to get out there on, in the field. Uh, because there is a very different aspect because I have to you know, forecast, but I have this whole team uh, sitting back at the weather network that's working away. And that's uh, Doug and Chris's team to, to really sort of be able to bounce my ideas off of them. And quite often I'll go with, I'll, I'll have a forecast and then I'll go and talk to them and they'll say, uh, this is where you're wrong here, 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 and here. And I'll just say, oh, okay. And, and realize that the, uh, you know, that uh, they've had a lot more time to look at this and they're far smarter than me. I mean, again, I'm the one that they send out in the wind and in the rain and everything else, the uncomfortable. And then I go, yeah, this is fun. Um, but I've also gotten a chance to, uh, to go down to Tornado Alley um, many, many times. And uh, I'm going to show you um, the uh, uh, one video from Tornado Alley where I met my chase partner and co-host for um, uh, Storm Hunters, Jacqueline Whittle. Um, and Jack uh, started her career as, in, in a sort of a different way. She came at it from a, a performance point of view and then um, basically learned all the meteorology that she needs to know. And I would call her an absolute tip top forecaster. She's absolutely amazing, but she did come at it in a very different way. So there's different um, ways to come at this sort of stuff. Um, and I'm just gonna show you, this is Ada, Oklahoma um, in 2012, I believe it was. There it is. Tornado. This is intense. So yeah, I mean, it uh, for me, it's one thing to you know read in papers, do the forecasting, take a look at the radar, um, and see the storms that are going on, or read a little bit about it. It's entirely something else to quite literally see the suction vortices of this tornado uh, pulling trees out of the ground. Uh, or uh, feel the inflow uh, while you're sitting in sort of in the inflow jet and it's just hammering into the, uh, into the, into the storm. So that's a, an aspect of it. And, and just one, one last quick little thing because I don't want to take too much more time. Um, the one time that I actually got to, to really make a huge difference and, and it was really important to me was in the Windsor LaSalle tornado. Um, it was an unexpected tornado a couple of years ago. And I was literally the only one that was watching this tornado as it cut through, uh, cut through the, the Windsor and, and LaSalle. And we were actually able to get that on air to the, um, to the weather network and let everybody know exactly what was going on. And uh, that, was, uh, that, was, that made a real difference for me. So anyway, uh, thank you so much. And uh, if there's any questions or Chris, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll throw it back over to you. Sure. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I went out storm chasing last summer here in Calgary and there was a tornado warning for the city and it was intense. I uh, see, I, I was always, I'm always on the side of like just forecasting, forecasting, forecasting. And then I finally got the opportunity to storm chase and wow, that, you know, now, now, now I'm hooked. So I got to like both now. So I don't know. Uh, but no, that, that's awesome. That's amazing. If anyone has any questions for um, Mark, please, please type them in the chat uh, or uh, unmute your mic and uh, ask away. Uh, so Kate asks, you mentioned being in close proximity of the El Reno tornado. What was it like? Uh, the El Reno tornado was a uh, experience almost like no other I've had in, uh, in, in, in storm chasing and being out there uh, in the field, simply because the, uh, this was the largest tornado as ever recorded at this point. 
uh, like the widest. Um, and when we were standing in front of it, myself and Jacqueline, we didn't realize what we were looking at. Uh, the tornado literally seemed to stretch from sort of horizon to horizon. And all we saw was a gray wall. Uh, and we were looking on radar and sort of saying, there's something in there. Like the, the rotation on this is absolutely off of scale. Uh, what, what's going on? What's going on? And suddenly we realized that the whole thing was the tornado. Um, at that point, we jumped in the car and just blasted south to get out of the way. And it was only later the next day that we found out that uh, we had lost uh, colleagues in that tornado. Uh, but at the same time, like during, during that day, we were hearing like just absolute horror stories. We had a friend of ours um, that, that managed to get to, to, to where we were. And he was basically crying because he said he watched chasers get swallowed by the tornado behind him. Um, he got out of the way and uh, he was watching that. And we were seeing um, on SpotterNet and, and some of the other ways we get information into the cars that, you know, friends had just stopped speaking. They stopped talking uh, on the phone. We couldn't, we couldn't get a hold of them. Uh, it, was, um, it, it was sort of a horrific day in many ways, but in terms of, uh, you know, sort of being a historical event, it was, uh, it was incredible from a meteorological point of view. Indeed, it was a very uh, sad day and it really kind of emphasized the need for weather communication. So just kind of get those warnings out. Uh, so that answers your question, Kate. Um, if anyone has any other questions for Mark, uh, just pop them in the chat. We'll try to get to them at the end. Uh, for our last presenter, uh, it is Doe Stain, who is a Earth and Ocean Atmospheric Science Professor at the University of British Columbia, as well as the CMOS Director of Publications. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for being here. So I would like to take a rather broader perspective of uh, careers in meteorology, since this is primarily, oh, let me give you a full screen. Since this is intended to be uh, a broad careers uh, event. So I have spent 35 years, it's an enormously privileged career as a professor, uh, at UBC, uh, have taught in a variety of programs, including the Atmospheric Science Program, amongst others, and uh, have spent a lot of that time advising students uh, about academic matters, about career matters, and, uh, and have supervised uh, many students, undergraduate and graduate, and watched them transition into careers. And I suspect uh, some of those experiences may be useful to you recognize that the degrees you're going to get uh, lead to a number of, of careers that have a number of components. It's not just one job. Ultimately, if you break it all down, there are three categories of things that you will do, things that people will pay you to do, things that will give you satisfaction. Those are teaching or training. And of course, that's particularly pertinent in an academic career. But also, uh, in many careers, you do what might be called administration or service or leadership. You, you will proceed through your career and discover yourself in an administration position or leadership position. Positions which give service to your co-workers or the community around you. And, and that's part of a career. And then finally, the third component, very broadly said, could be technical or operational or research. Um, those three are, are easy for you to understand because much of your undergraduate degree has to do with the technical, operational and research. Very little of what you're being taught in your degrees, in fact, have to do with the first two components, but they are legitimate components. And the sooner you learn what they're about and what they require, the better. And we could, we could talk about any one of those uh, in, in tremendous detail. I don't think here's the place to do it, but recognize that uh, your degree in meteorology will lead you into careers that require all of those three components in various mixes and at various stages in your career development. Recognize also, 
that the the careers which are open to you come in four separate categories not only in the realm of weather forecasting for the weather network or Pelmorex, those are totally legitimate careers, but really they come in four different categories. In academe, if you really do want to become an academic, there's a, a career absolutely awaiting there. It's an amazing career. Um, I have had so much fun at it. The most fun that I could ever have thought I might have. Uh, interesting, stimulating, inspiring, um, and, and, uh, and a, a great way to spend one's life. Um, there are careers in industry, and, and the primary industry you may think of would be the weather forecast industry, in which you serve as a forecaster for Weather Network, Pelmerix, um, or, or other organizations. However, there are many industries that require meteorologists on staff. The aviation industry, the marine, the maritime navigation industry, um, some many industries require meteorologists who have training in environmental applications of meteorology and atmospheric science, particularly air quality, hydrology, hydrologic forecasting. All of those are careers which you could legitimately uh, approach, uh, careers for which your technical and undergraduate and graduate training will suit you tremendously well. Then there are careers in the consulting industry. There are many, many around the world consulting companies, some large, some small, that provide um, services that require the skills of a meteorologist. Some of them in air quality, some of them in, um, in hydrology, uh, some of them in forecasting, uh, some of them in engineering applications of meteorological sciences, some in energy, wind energy, for example, and many um, uh, uh, electric uh, facilities uh, and infrastructure companies require the services of meteorologists. And then finally, there are careers in government. And, and of course, government forecasting is the obvious one that you would all think of. But in reality, there are government agencies which uh, would use your skills as a meteorologist. Uh, the obvious and most obvious one next would be, uh, would be fisheries and oceans. Uh, they require forecasters, uh, fisheries and oceans, uh, and, and sorry, Natural Resources Canada <clears throat> is also a government department in, at the federal level. And then there are positions available in the federal environmental assessment agencies and all over Environment and Climate Change Canada outside of the atmospheric environment, but in broad environmental areas. That is the federal government. Similar opportunities exist in provincial governments. Every provincial government has branches which deal with subject matter in which you as meteorologists will be trained uh, to, to perform. And then finally, there are some uh, government structures at the sub-provincial level, regional city governments in which you, uh, you with your training could find careers. So please recognize the breadth of career opportunities, the range of places to which you could go to find a position. Recognize those, understand the differences and, and start seeking positions there if when you're seeking jobs. So how, how do you get there? Well, one of the most important things next to your education, the next most important thing in finding a career is to build networks. Build networks amongst your colleagues, build networks amongst people who are already in industry, and build your network of mentors. Mentors are extraordinarily important in helping you take that particularly difficult first step into an industry, into your position. Of course, they're, they're, your colleagues are important. Of course, your colleagues help you. Of course, they are contacts. But mentors have a very particular role. And probably the most important role mentors will have is that if, if the mentoring has been done properly, and if you participate fully in it, your mentors are the best people to write the letters of reference that get you the job. The reason they're the best people is that they know you in more detail, 
in a professional sense than anyone else will. These are the people who understand your strengths, who understand, understand your weaknesses, who understand your skills, who understand what you will bring to a, an employer. And they are people who can write or, or phone or however references are delivered, the most informed, the most detailed and the most useful references. Please be aware of the importance of building uh, a network of mentors who will help you in your career. Um, all, all of this is very well, but ultimately it all rests on what you are and what you can do. And it is extraordinarily important to realize that there are two kinds of knowledge which you contain with you. The first one is the book knowledge. That's the stuff you learn in your courses at university. That's the stuff you learn from reading books, from studying texts, from doing the exercises that are required in your courses. The mechanical things that, that, that get you the degree, that pass you the exams, that finally get you onto the podium to get to win your degree. In parallel with that, there's what I call self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is an understanding of who you are, of what you are, of what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what you like doing, and what you don't like doing, where you really want to go with your career. Recognize that self-knowledge is often a threatening thing. Some people have great difficulty looking into themselves and saying, I'm not good at that. I should avoid a career that involves that. But it is the only way to build a satisfying career and recognize without self-knowledge, there's no way you're gonna effectively use the book knowledge you have. Where do you learn self-knowledge? Well, you learn it through all of your life experiences. You learn it to a certain extent through schools, though I, my opinion of grade school and high school is that those, they are so structured and regimented, you have very little chance to gain self-knowledge. My experience is that most students I've advised gain their self-knowledge through their years at university. And in my opinion, the students who come to me as an advisor and say, oh my goodness, I've realized I'm in the wrong major and I'm gonna to have to take an extra year to complete my degree. Those are the students who are finally learning self-knowledge. They're finally understanding what they actually want to do, where their passions are and what they wanna get out of life. So please pay some attention to self-knowledge, pay enormous attention to understanding yourself and what your strengths are. Uh, just before I, before I go on here, um, you know, Doug said, learn from a busted forecast. And that's an extremely important thing. Recognize that what Doug said was a specific category of something I once heard someone say. It was actually a dean giving a talk to students. And she said, fail, learn to fail regularly. Learn to fail in public. It is the only way you grow. That is part of gaining self-knowledge. It is probably the most profound and important part of self-knowledge is learn by exploring the limits to your capabilities. I can't go through this talk without talking about graduate studies. Graduate studies are absolutely the most exciting thing you could do in your life. They will stretch you, they will extend you, they will inspire you, they will move you to achieve the greatest things you can. They could also lead to an academic career. <laughs> Than it should be to an academic career. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this here. I'm very happy to talk to anyone about how to get into graduate studies. Um, but I think uh, uh, this is probably not the place to talk about them uh, in, in much detail. Um, and finally, when you finally get there at the end, you'll discover that your life only makes sense when lived backwards. All of the decisions you make are made at the moment, 
without a particularly clear idea of where they're going and where they're leading. Recognize that when you make a decision, you make a decision based on the knowledge you have at the moment. What is my degree? What are the career opportunities available? Where are the jobs? And then you take that decision. You make the decision and you live with the decision. And finally, when you get to a point and you can look back at your life, you can say, oh yeah, that one made sense. And yeah, that was right. Yeah, I did it because, well, that was the next thing I had to do. And all of this relies on a philosophy that I have always held. Whenever you have to make a decision, no matter how difficult the decision is, once you've made it, live your life in order to make sure that that was a correct decision. So I'm happy to take questions. I know I've spoken in a very general sense and many of the other speakers have been quite specific. I think it's time to step back and think broadly about where you are and where your career is going. Thank you so much. And um, again, as uh, Do had mentioned, uh, please ask any questions. Uh, and not only for Doe, but for any of the presenters. If anyone has any questions, we're uh, nearing the last 10 minutes here of the presentation. So if anyone has any questions for any of the uh, presenters, please. Uh, I think it would be really nice if we saw some faces. How about switching on some videos, guys? Yeah. And, and, yeah and I'm Zoom is bad them. enough, but <laughs> Zoom with a bunch of names is terribly impersonal. Yeah. Hello, Amanda. Hi, Chris. Hi there, Jim. Any questions? Uh, hi, though. I have a question. Sure. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned that uh, you think it would be a great idea to pursue graduate st studies um, for in meteorology. I just wonder if a student already completed his master, would you also recommend him to continue getting a PhD if he wants to eventually become a research meteorologist? Okay, so the first comment to make is PhD is wonderful. My PhD was the most exciting time of my life. It is the only time of your life when you are truly free to pursue an avenue of research, a bit of intellectual inquiry, and it must inspire you. However, be warned, a PhD actually does not broaden your career opportunities. It narrows your career opportunities. Indeed, with a PhD, there's a wide range of jobs you could do, wide range of things you could do. But when you get a PhD, your expectations rise. And you, you're not going to be willing to go and be a barista or or, or a checkout person at a supermarket or a forecast meteorologist on the bench. You, you're going to narrow your, your career. So be aware of that. You only do a PhD if you really want to. However, the rewards are enormous. And absolutely, if you're interested in a research career, it is the, the, the research tools you will learn in a PhD that will set you up for a real career in research. You know, one of the, one of the most interesting things that, that you probably have not thought about is when, when, when we approach a PhD student, we expect them to have reached a, a, a scholarly level that they are self-learners. That's the reason why graduate courses have no prerequisites. It is assumed that when you get to that level, you can teach yourself anything you need in order to prepare for a given course. There's an expectation of scholarly behavior, of, of uh, intellectual maturity uh, that is uh, inspiring and exciting. If, if, you're, if you're the student. Um, PhDs are wonderful because you, well, masters as well, graduate studies are, are wonderful because you, you, you conduct those within a team of colleagues, all of whom are working in roughly the same direction. And the, uh, the inspiration that comes from bouncing ideas uh, in a technical area or in a philosophical area of people who are interested in the same things that's an unbeatable experience. And, and hopefully you will have supervisors who understand that and, and who build a research team that, that is inspiring. If it works well, you will learn as much from your 
research graduate student colleagues as you will from the courses you're taking. And that's as it should be. So yes, Chris, if you're interested in it, absolutely go for it. And there are many fine doctoral programs available across Canada, across the USA, and in fact, around the world. Your, your master's degree in a Canadian university will stand you in extremely good stead. I say this because I have seen PhDs around the world. I have served as a university examiner for a final doctoral exam in Australia, England, Sweden, South Africa, USA, and across Canada. And I know that the Canadian system is as thorough and as rigorous as you can get. You're in an excellent position. Thank you so much for your opinion and the sure, advice. For sure. Uh, I think probably just the last question here is comes from Travis. Um, he just says, uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for sharing all the wonderful insights. I'm a PhD candidate whose work is in climate change science with a research focus on weather extremes. I've also taught introductory meteor meteorology and have forecasting experience independently. I was just wondering what potential research career opportunities broadly could look like down the line at Environment Canada and or the Weather Network, even with a more limited math physics background, but one that is centered on uh, statistics and programming. What are your broad thoughts on this? I apologize for the long-winded question, but this is open to all presenters. No, no, no problem at all, Travis. In fact, it's a question that many people, a style of question many people will ask. So <clears throat> the first and simplest answer is uh, go and have a look at the uh, PKIX, uh, which is based in Victoria, it's the Pacific Institute for Climate Studies. Sorry, I may have got that wrong. Google it, someone find it for me and help Travis. Um, it's an organization that works on climate impact studies. And, and it sounds to me from what you said is that your background is outstanding for them. They have a program of, of postdocs, uh, which uh, you might well be able to fill. However, recognize that, that climate change is upon us and all of the world is going to have to adjust to, to changed environments. You are well positioned to find a job and a career in the next decades based on your understanding of climate, particularly the statistics of climate. For instance, the insurance industries are running scared about their risk with regards to changing climates. You, you, you should start talking to the insurance industries, not individual insurance companies, but in fact, the industry as a whole, the umbrella insurance organizations, they are all desperate to understand uh, the consequences of climate change for their work. Um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, you know, all the environments are changing and, and as a result, fish migration is changing. They need people who will understand that uh, the consequences of climate change on marine ecosystems. Similarly, forest fires are changing around the world, uh, particularly in Canada, an increase in the frequency. There too are areas for study. And again, emphasizing my point earlier, the, the use of statistics is absolutely crucial. Learn as much statistics as you can. Learn Bayesian statistics. Learn how to do extreme value statistics. Extreme values are what, what's gonna be driving the changes. That, that, that is where, you, where I think your skills are gonna, uh, are gonna be very important. Amanda, you were next. Oh, just, uh, yeah, um, about, so my degree is specializing in climate, but it's an undergrad degree and I'm considering graduate school, but of course COVID is like thrown everything out of whack. And now that I'm starting to look at master's programs, I'm finding out that a lot of them required an, an honors. So I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, how to fit that into my degree during, during COVID and remote work. So just, just wondering about honors. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question, Amanda. You know, the whole business of an honors degree in Canada is kind of vexed. 
Um, the way Canadian academy, academies worked is we used to have three-year degrees, three years bachelor's, and then there was an additional honors and you needed a certain grade level to get into the honors. What has happened is that, that all of our bachelors are now four-year degrees and the honors is simply an enhanced set of, of courses on top of that. One, one simple approach is to undertake a diploma in meteorology or a diploma in some technical area which will strengthen your skills. So I know UBC offers a diploma in meteorology, Dalhousie used to, uh, York University also offers a one-year diploma in meteorology and effectively it is an honors year. It is somewhat more compressed than a final year of a, of a four-year bachelor's um, and, and it is it consists of primarily senior courses in, in whatever the subject is. Um, you know, Amanda, I, I, I do, I, I really want you to try and think more broadly than what might, and I don't know exactly how you're thinking, so just forgive me if I'm not on the wrong track here, but I, I do want you to think more broadly than the standard mode of what might be a degree in meteorology or atmospheric science. If you're interested in climate, climate is a much, much broader subject uh, academically than, than uh, meteorology. And there are many, many topics which are of huge climate relevance, topics, uh, approaches, um, uh, intellectual behavior, um, academic subjects. And it may well be that if, if you find a potential supervisor, uh, who has a particular approach to, um, yeah, let me, let me give you an example. At UBC, there's a professor of geography called Simon Donner, who does a huge amount of interesting work in societal consequences of climate change. The work is somewhat technical. Simon's a technical kind of guy, but he's, his research is moving more and more into the areas of climate impacts. So, yeah, you know, let, let me let me say this. Um, I frankly believe that all climate scientists should instantly, this moment, retire. We know enough about climate change to tell the world what is happening. Hmm. The, we know the climate is changing. We understand the magnitude. We understand the statistics of changed climates. What we do not understand Sorry, and then back up another step. Mostly we understand what is needed to reverse climate change, or at least bring it to a fixed point where we have one and a half degrees C of warming baked in. What we do not know are the economic consequences of under undergoing those changes. We do not know the societal consequences, how societies will react, how global demographics will react to climate change. We do not know what the psychological dimensions are of a global population adjusting to a changed climate. We don't need any more climate science. What we need to know is the economics of how global economies are going to react to a changed climate in the face, might I add, of probably the biggest challenge this world faces rather than just the climate change, and that is a declining global population. There's now much writing which claims that we will reach a population maximum somewhere around 2035 to 2050. Thereafter, global, climate, global population will decline. That in the face of climate change is going to be totally revolutionary. And this will occur in your lives. There's no economist on this planet who knows how to deal with a permanently shrinking economy. That's why we know enough climate. It's the other things that we know, need to know about. So Amanda, you could, in a directed way, build yourself a master's in climate application, not in climate science, but in climate application. Does that help at all? It does, thank you. Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I moved from hard sciences into social sciences 
because I saw it was the application, not the technical. And now that I'm doing a co-op, I'm finding that users won't use our data unless it meets their needs. And their needs are so much greater than hard science. There's a million steps of that value added chain. There's all of these aspects of, of behavior and, and different pressures going on. Actually, my core thing that I wanna study is our, our values and our spirituality and why we can know with the, the rational part of our brain, why things are so scary and critical, and yet we don't act. Those, those reasons that hold us back from action. Um, I'm just gonna put in the chat here a reference that I came across. It's how we have uh, to create knowledge action systems. And it's not just giving people facts, it's developing reflexive wisdom. And we're so many steps away from that. Um, thank you. This this is really, um, really beneficial for me to hear that this is the direction that other people know we are needing to trend is towards what's holding us back and how do we deal with it and how do we deal behaviorally and, and economically with these issues. Absolutely. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. You know, I... I've, I've actually done, uh, apart from my academic work, I did quite a lot of consulting. And one of the things that, that was really became evident to me is this huge gulf between the academic uh, world and the world of applications and policy. And it became immediately obvious to me that an academic will ask a question and a policymaker will say, uh, I, I don't even understand the question. I don't even know why you'd want to ask that question. Whereas a policymaker will ask a question and the academic will say, well, that's ridiculous. No one could ever answer that question. Could you find a question I could answer? And that, that gulf lies because there is a, a gulf between the application and the, and the, uh, and the science. And, and we need to bridge that gulf. And you're, you're right, the psychological, in my mind, psychology is the most difficult subject on the planet because I am both the subject and object of the study of psychology. I find that terrifying. Great, great, uh, great discussion. Um, and if anyone else has any uh, questions, uh, feel free to email students at cmos.ca and I can uh, uh, get you in touch with uh, our five presenters today. Um, so, but yeah, unfortunately, we're five minutes over our time, uh, so we're out of time, unfortunately, but feel free to email me any of your questions that you can think of. Um, and I want to thank everyone that uh, joined. And of, of course, I want to thank all of our presenters. Thank you so much for volunteering your time. Uh, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Uh, take care. <laughs>